Our scripture today is found in the 48th Psalm. We sang about it. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great King. A great passage of Scripture. Please turn with me there. Psalm 48. Our text verse is verse number 14. Verse number 14 in Psalm 48. It is a song and a psalm for the sons of Korah. What that means is that it is not only the inspired Word of God, but it's something that they sang just like we sang this morning. It's a song and a psalm. And it says in the 14th verse of the 48th psalm, for this God, not some other God, not some God that is worshipped by others in a false religion, not the God of other world religions, and not the God that's made up in a person's own mind. And even those who claim to be Christians who are not drawing their information from the Word of God, we're, we're singing about, we're talking about, we're excited about the God of the Bible. You need to get into the Word until the Word gets into you and understand who this God is. The main character of the Bible is Jesus Christ. The subject of the Bible is redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. The next time somebody asks you, what's the main gist of the Bible? What does it mean? You say it means redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Say it. The redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Redemption of my soul. Redemption of lost mankind through the blood of Jesus Christ. So this God is our God. Now, our goal between life, uh, when life comes and we are born and we are here until the time we die, sometime between birth and death, we make this God our God. We make Him ours personally by receiving Jesus Christ as personal Savior. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. On the front of your bulletin, there is a map. Does that look familiar, son? The map that's there? Any of that? It should. It's where you live. That's right. Northern California. And some of you wonder, what in the world is all that about? All right, so that's on the front. He will be our guide, it says on the front. God's direction is always best, and that is also absolutely true. Have you ever got lost? You say, I've never been lost. I was uh, temporarily disoriented. How many men here refuse to ever admit that you were lost? Raise your hand. Come on. How many wives wish they would? Yes. All right. Some of you would like to give me a raise because of that. It's, uh, it's one of those, one of those uh, differences between males and females, you see. Uh, males, even when they're lost, they don't think they're lost. Even when they're horribly lost, they won't admit they're lost. And, uh, and she says for the 15th time, just stop and get directions. Right? Isn't that it? And you say, I'm just, I'm working on a shortcut. That's all there is to it. With God, we have a guide. With the Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth, the truth of the Word of God. We have a guide. And we ought to learn from our Heavenly Father how to be an earthly father. It says out on the marquee in the front that uh, dads, fathers should be loving leaders. And that's the kind of Heavenly Father we have, a loving leader. If you were to read Ephesians 6 and Colossians 3, we're not going to do it now, you would find that in both scriptures it tells kids to obey parents, but it says, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Don't, don't, don't. Don't just be a rule enforcer or a pain inflictor. Parents need to be balanced. Dad needs to be balanced. He needs to be a loving leader. Firmness, yes, but with love. Listen to me. You've heard me say it maybe a hundred times here. That rules without relationship equals rebellion. We need to have a relationship with our kids. Kids and parents need to have a warm current relationship. If there's something going on in your family right now where somebody's not talking to somebody, fix it. Fix it by the grace of God that you might be able to have that kind of communication that we ought to have. Father, I pray now that you'll bless as we teach and preach today. 
Take the Word of God, drive it deep into our heart. Lord, we want to be the kind of parent that you are to us as your children by faith in Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There are some things we read about our Heavenly Father here. Great is the Lord. Now, it doesn't, it's, it's not just like we say, oh, that's great. But great is a description of the Lord. Great is because of His attributes, because of who He is, and because of what He does. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. If you've got a father like that, or if you are a father like that, then you're following in the example of our Heavenly Father. He is a great God. He is the great King spoken of here. Notice also He instills fear in verse number 6. Fear took hold on them there. Fear. Now, when it comes to our respect for our Heavenly Father, it is reverential fear. When it comes to respect for our earthly Father, it should be in the same measure, reverential fear, not paralyzing fear. And dads, we want to make sure that our kids always understand that they are loved and they are accepted. Nobody is loved because they measure up. None of us measure up. Only through Jesus Christ do we measure up. So don't force your kids to try to live up to a certain standard in order to earn love. Love is not earned. Love is given, freely given. It is offered. And God's love is a special kind of love. Come back tonight. I'll talk about that some more. And so there has to be a balance. Our God is the most balanced being in the universe. He is balanced in every respect. We have identified and, uh, and have named 23 attributes of God found in the Word of God. And all 20 of them are perfectly balanced. He is love, but He is also just. He is righteous. He is holy. He is light. He is life. He is all of those things in perfect balance. He's great. God is known, it says, in her palaces for a refuge. Now, parents should be the kind of refuge to whom children can come when somebody's bullied them at school, when somebody has picked on them in the neighborhood, when they don't understand the order of things in life or why things are the way they are, why parents ought to be a refuge, just like God is a refuge. So here we have some descriptive terms about our God. How these reflect upon us and we in turn ought to reflect them. It says, uh, as we have heard, verse 8, as we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. Now, God is uh, capable of doing things that are permanent, that last for eternity. I don't have that quality, but whatever I do, it should have a long-term view to it. When I'm raising my children, conducting my marriage, when I'm dealing with the life's decisions and choices, they should all be based upon eternity or a long period of time. Not the short term, but the long term. It should be based upon that which is established, that which has a basis, that which is solid. That's the way we need to make choices. Too many of us make our choices on the fly. We think of ourselves as being so intelligent, so experienced, we are so capable that we don't go to God and say, Lord, I need you again today. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it just seems to be out of, out of uh, the course of our, of our everyday structure and our routine. But we need to be going to God and saying, Lord, I can't parent. I can't conduct my marriage. I can't take care of my finances. I can't handle my job without your help today. Lord, I need you today. Why? Because he's great. Why? Because he's known. Why? Because he is uh, feared with reverential fear. Why? Because he is an establishing God. And parents, and those of us who are in authority, and those of us who have influence over others, we ought to have those kind of qualities on an earthly basis as well. According to thy name, it says in verse 10, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. We ought to make righteous choices, righteous decisions. Our thoughts should be righteous th thoughts. Our words ought to be righteous words. This is going to happen if we get into the Word of God. The Bible tells us that we ought to 
surrender ourselves, offer our bodies a living sacrifice. And then our minds need to be transformed by the Word of God. This will only happen, this will only happen when we yield to God and His Word. It says in verse 11, Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of thy judgments. Now, most people are not happy because of judgments. He's a judge, as we read earlier. He breaks up the ships of Tarshish and so forth. He is, uh, he is a judge, according to verse number 11. But it is righteous judgment. It is correct judgment. Some people don't like to make decisions. They want to be Mr. or Mrs. Nice Guy. And they're hoping that, that they'll never have to make a tough decision. Let me tell you, tough decisions made according to God's perfect will will mold your character and will make you the person that God wants you to be. Teach your children. Don't shelter them from every tough thing in life. But guide them through. Help them through. And, and they will realize what God is doing here for us that we can do for them as well. We can guide them through the tough times, the hard times as well. Don't shrink from them. Take on a challenge. I knew a girl in high school. She had the highest academic average. It was almost perfect. It was 99.9% .9 in her actual academic studies. And the way she did it, she was known for this. Whenever she took a subject, you had three weeks to transfer out of that subject into another subject. If she wasn't getting 100s, in the first three weeks, she would transfer to another easier class. And she graduated with a 99.9. .9. That's summa, summa, summa. I mean, she was top of the class. And, uh, you know, I was back a little ways, but I could, see, I could see her there, top of the class. But it was always by design she would not accept the tough challenge. I took a couple of subjects I gladly would have traded in. How about you? I took some subjects, I still don't know why I took them other than the fact that it was the discipline of taking them. I had the audacity to ask my algebra teacher, why are we doing this algebra? I mean, I, I expected an answer. And he said, because you're going to want to measure a swamp someday. Or you're going to want to be able to, you know. And I thought to myself, I have never yet wanted to measure a swamp. But taking algebra exercises your thinking processes. And it's a discipline. And so I understand that. I want you to know that when your kids are going through tough times, you help them by the grace of God. And you say, God's going to help us through. When they're having a tough time in school, you pray with them in the morning. When they've got a bully or somebody that's challenging them, you pray in the morning. Now, you might take other means also, but you pray with your kids first thing. So they won't be afraid to go to school. So they won't be afraid to face their challenges. When they've got a task or a chore, you let them try that chore until they get it right. I'm going to tell something on you. Where's, there's, there's Nana, okay? When you started to drive, it wasn't always perfect, was it? In your yard, there was a great big huge stone. And you drove over it once with Dad's car, didn't you? And you were, you were a little apprehensive, weren't you? And what did he do? He came out and he said, what? Get back in the car. Do it right this time. Praise the Lord. I thank God for a father-in-law like that. Amen. Get back in the car. Do it right this time. Amen. Instead of yanking her out of there and saying, you're never going to drive again. If you've ever fallen off a bike, what do they say? Get back on the bike again. Now, in my lifetime, I have been a very experienced horseman. She, she had a horse when she was a teenager. She owned a horse. And... Um, uh, in fact, I asked her if I'd come over and ride her horse sometime. But um, I was a horseman. I learned to ride horses, and I learned from the best. I learned how to, how to understand and appreciate horses. Um, but <clears throat> the, the, the thing is, with, with a horse, uh, with any animal, there is a discipline involved. There's a very, very important discipline that's involved in that. When I was a little kid... I'd fallen off some old plug that they had up at camp for, for trail riding. The, the horse decided to jump over a log, and I wasn't holding on that second. I went off straight off the back of that horse. And I was, I was about eight years old, and I was crying in the dust. And my dad came to me, dusted me off, said, Are you okay, son? I said, Yes, I, I think I'll, I'll live. And, and 
And he said, all right, we're going to get back on the horse. I said, no, Dad, anything but that. I'm not getting back on the horse. To my father's credit, he said, oh, this is not open for discussion. You're going to get back on that horse. And I got back on that horse, and the result was I became a horseman. I became a horseman. I would be afraid of horses to this day if I'd stayed in the dust eight years of age. There are challenges in life that your kids are going to face, challenges that you're going to face. And by God's grace, you can get on the horse, you can get on the bike, you can go again. Some of you have been burned in life. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that burned out, charred out uh, cinder of a life. I want you to lay it before God at the altar today and say, Lord, uh, this is a mess. There's, there's nothing left of my life. I want you to give what's burned out and what's charred. I want you to give it to God and start over again because he's the God of the second chance. He's going to help you. As you go on your way, whatever is going on with you right now, Jerusalem here pictures the qualities or the attributes of God, the main, the main one there. It says in verse 12, walk about Zion, go round about her, tell her the towers there, do a survey, mark ye well her bulwarks, that's the defenses, consider her palaces that she may tell it to the generation following. I want to be able to know what my God can do so I can tell these boys over here. I can tell those that are coming after us what God can do. I'm, I'm talking about the God of the Bible, the God I prayed to this morning, the God who said, it's going to be all right. That service has got so much in it, but you're going to get done. You're going to get done on time. There's going to be spiritual results. People are going to make decisions for eternity. Folks are going to come to know Jesus Christ. It's going to be okay. That's the God I talked to this morning. You say, my family's... A little dysfunctional. Dr. Henry Cloud. Some people recognize him as an authority. He's a writer. He, he has a method of helping people understand that because of sin, all families have a certain level of dysfunction. During a lecture, he will ask everyone who did not come from a dysfunctional family to stand. So the people that stand up, he'll then tell the rest of the crowd to look at those who are standing and they can see what a person in denial looks like. Why? Because to some degree, every one of us and our families are dysfunctional. That's why we need God. Now, I don't want you to get a bumper sticker that says, I'm dysfunctional, you're dysfunctional, we're all dysfunctional, ain't it great being dysfunctional? I don't want you to do that. But I want you to know the challenges that we have. In 1960, the percentage of of children in the United States living with both their mother and father was 81%. And now it's 57%. But I do thank God for blended families. Even though it might have been a rough road getting where you are, I thank God that you're together, that you're legally married, that you're living, you're trying to live with dignity before God and people. And 46 of every 100 marriages is a remarriage for one or both partners in America today. 46 of every 100. Now, step families in this area are more prevalent than traditional nuclear families. And what do I say? I say, praise God, there's an opportunity to minister to each and every person. It does not matter to me where you came from, who you are, how you got here. I'm just glad you're here. And I'm glad that our God is going to show you His way in your life with all the challenges that you face, each and every one of us. Who needs one more person condemning them for the fact that they're trying to do their best? They're trying to get here. They're trying to move on for God. I kind of like this situation. They were going through Cooperstown. Who knows what's in Cooperstown? What is it? It's the Baseball Hall of Fame. You got all, you got, you got Gehrig, and you got, you got Mantle, and you got Maris, and uh, you even got T Casey Stengel. You've got all of the, all the greats, all the colorful people that, that made that the great Hall of Fame. The great, unparalleled, in my opinion, the greatest potential cut short the greatest baseball player in modern times, Roberto Clemente. Pittsburgh, the best. All of them are enshrined there. They were going through and they were cleaning up and they reached behind one of the displays to dust it and they pulled out 
a little folded piece of paper. I got a couple of folded pieces of paper from the boys this morning with happy birthday, Poppy, on it. Happy, uh, uh, happy Father's Day, Poppy. And uh, that's precious. There was a folded piece of paper and there was a photograph. And it, some old ball player from back in the earlier days, a photograph in his baseball stuff, and it said Sinclair Oil across the front, which is not a major league team last time I checked. Sinclair Oil. But there was a note written, and here's what it said. You were never too tired to play ball. On your days off, you helped build the Little League field. You always came to watch me play. You were a Hall of Fame dad. I wish I could share this moment with you, your son Peter. There are many famous ball players there, but there's an unknown ball player who's got a kid named Peter that thought his dad was Hall of Fame. And he took a worn out photograph, wrapped it up in a handwritten note, and placed it there in Cooperstown. I want you to know that that's what we should strive for. Our desire should be to be a Hall of Fame dad. I've told this story, true story. Olympics. I want you to picture it. 1980s. The Olympics. The 4x110 relay featured a run runner by the name of Derek Redmond. And the UK was about to win a gold medal in the 4x110. But uh, they, they did not. They did not because when it came to the home stretch, Derek Redmond, his Achilles snapped. And he dropped on the track, writhing in pain. And everything came to a dead silence. The other runners went on and finished the race while the camera zoomed in on Derek Redmond. And as he struggled to his feet, struggled to his feet, and, and then fell again, and struggled to his feet, and then fell again, all of a sudden, there was a commotion up in the, up the upper seats of the stadium. A man with gray at the temples was coming down. He was coming down through the seats. He's saying, move aside, move aside, move aside, move aside, move aside, all the way down. And they tried to restrain him. The guards tried to stop him from going on the track. And he said, that's my son over there, Derek Redman, and I'm going to him. And they let him pass. And the race was over, except for Derek Redman. And his dad went down, picked him up, put his arm around his shoulder, and the two of them walked across the finish line. As far as that day was concerned, nobody can even tell you who won that relay. They haven't got a clue because everybody was watching Derek Redmond's dad come down out of the stands to help him across the line. Somewhere in this world, there's somebody right now. They're down. Worse than Derek Redmond. Worse than a torn Achilles. They're not going to get up. But all of a sudden, out of the heavenly stands, here comes the Lord Jesus Christ all the way down. Down to our level. Helps Him up. He does so when we receive Him as Savior. He does so when we acknowledge Him as Lord. He helps us up to our feet. Maybe some fallen Christian. Jesus Christ came down. I know as dads, we want to be like Derek Redmond's dad. We want to help our kids up. But there's somebody who wants even more to help. There's someone who loves even more than we love. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you bow your head? You've been viewing a service at Central Baptist Church. We never dismiss the service without clearly presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is that Jesus came to this earth and sinlessly lived for 33 years before he voluntarily gave his life. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose from the dead. And he's alive forevermore. Through the shedding of his blood and through his victory at uh, the, the empty tomb, 
Jesus Christ now offers salvation to you. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray right now from your heart to God and ask Him to save you? Something like this. Dear God, just pray, Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I deserve to pay for my sins. I deserve to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus died to save me. I believe Jesus died to save me. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Did you pray that prayer? Did you mean it? Wonderful. I want you to get in contact with us and let us know of your decision. Now, if you've already been saved, I want to encourage you to live the life that God would have you to live according to His Word. If you desire more instruction, more information, we'll be happy to supply it to you. We like to talk to you. The information is right here, and we'd love to speak to you. If you have any spiritual needs whatsoever, may God bless you.